Good morning. Our first reading is from the third chapter of 2 Corinthians. If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit." Here ends the first reading. Please stand for the proclamation of the gospel. Which Greg just walked away with. (laughs) The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 8th chapter. To the Jews that had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? And Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your Father. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. And as you get comfortable, I'd like to begin with a prayer. Lord Jesus, thou who art the way, the truth, and the life, hear us as we pray for the truth that shall make all free. Teach us that liberty is not only to be loved, but also to be lived. Liberty is too precious a thing to be buried in books. It costs too much to be hoarded. Help us see that our liberty is not the right to do as we please, but the opportunity to please to do what is right. Amen. That is a prayer that the uh, Reverend Peter Marshall prayed before the Senate in 1947, just as World War II had ended and uh, in the early beginnings of the Korean War as it was getting started. And it's a starch reminder for all of us that liberty is not something that we get to keep, but it is something that we freely share. So friends, grace and peace to you from Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. This is the second time I get to experience this worship service. As you know, this is the first time I've been in on a weekend like like this, and it's fantastic. It's really, truly amazing. Uh, Fantastic to gather and remind ourselves of this great country that we live in. Well done again so far. (laughs) I shared with them. It was it was really exciting, especially the first time. But even the second time, it's it's very very fun, uh, exciting. But if the orchestra and the flags don't get your juices going, then check your pulse or check your neighbor's pulse, because you might not be alive. It's got a great feeling to it, right? Just a fantastic job. I look forward to a lot more to come. And although I am, as I alluded to, the new guy on the block, so to speak, I understand that this service is intentionally designed to lift up to lift up those who have uh, served in defense of this country, and to lift up our God. And we lift up those who have served throughout the years and the defense that allows us to continue to live in this freedom that the original signers of our Constitution had in mind. And yet, this is still a worship service, right? With all of the pomp and the circumstance of our country's celebration, we still remember today that our God is bigger 
than our country. And liberty is not just a word, but it's a lifestyle. And so our country is and has been for a while, as you know, in a very challenging and divisive time. We're encouraged to be active participants in our society, and yet, when someone doesn't agree with us or we don't agree with someone else, the loss of civility and basic conversational respect is truly challenged. It makes many of us sad, many of us angry, and many of us helpless. And I really can't imagine that this is what the designers of our Constitution had in mind when they drafted our governing documents. And it's not that we really owe it to them to continue with a civilized society, but we can do a lot better. And sometimes what helps bring us back into focus is a reminder of how things began, the sacrifices that were made for us in the, in the formation of this country. And so I hope you've heard about this recording in the past, but if you haven't, there's about a nine-minute reflection on the signers of our Declaration of Independence, and it's provided to us by the one and only Paul Harvey. He eloquently explains to us, and I'll try and sum it up, but quite simply, the cost of our liberty was not free. And I'm going to share the edited version, if you will. So in Independence Hall, there were men of means who met, not men who didn't have anything to lose, but lawyers and jurists and large plantation owners, men who played a significant role in the lives of not only their towns, but in the states, the new states that they represented. They knew the significance of what they had just done. They had just put their names to a document that intentionally separated them from what they had always known. So significant, in fact, that they kept their signatures hidden for six months after signing the doc that declaration and intentionally defying the ruling, ruling authority of England were 56 men who felt that liberty, the freedom from tyranny, was worth their sacrifice. And for most, it was a huge sacrifice. Many lost their properties, their families, and their lives. Five were captured by the British. Two lost sons in the, in the war. And actually, nine lost their lives in the war that followed. These were men who had everything to lose. They were prosperous, wealthy, very influential. And they were secure in their lives, and they could have continued in that comfort. But they valued liberty above their security. And we hear in that, in that uh, soliloquy the single most important line in that declaration. And this is what these men pledged. Our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. This is what they were willing to give up for the ideal of liberty, their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. So these men did. They sacrificed. They paid the price with their lives in cases, with their fortunes and most, but not with their sacred honor. That remained intact. And so what I shared with you is really doesn't just do justice to the actual dissertation, and I did use many of the words of Paul Harvey, so obviously we give him credit for that, but I would encourage you to go and to listen to this brief explanation, like I said, nine minutes, about the men who formed our country into the beacon of liberty that it is today. Share it with your kids. Share it with your grandkids. Help to give them a different perspective of this country other than the one that they're learning on TV and social media and even in school. It's a great reminder that the price of liberty was, and still is, very expensive. And so today, while we take this liberty for granted, our crises have changed. They're now global terrorism and food insecurity for 60 million or more, among others. And it's time for something different. It's time for a good old-fashioned revival. Ready? <laughs> Surprise! Didn't know you were coming to one, did you? But it's time to take our country kind of behind the, the woodshed and give them a good old come to Jesus message, all right? And who's going to lead the way? Well, we are, all of us. All of us who are sitting here today celebrating the freedoms that we enjoy and the comfort of this fantastic worship space, we all need a revival. Now, revivals are kind of scary. <laughs> I didn't grow up in a Christian denomination that has a revival tradition in their history, so I'm a little skeptical. But I grew up as a Lutheran kid. I've always had the joy of knowing Jesus Christ in my life. So revivals are kind of 
scary for me, right? I have images of excited people waving their hands and jumping for joy and preachers running around sweating profusely on the stage and running back and forth, challenging people to come up and accept Christ. I have visions of men and women almost passionately yelling at people to come forward and accept Jesus as changing their lives. Take this seriously. It's something that, quite frankly, I didn't grow up with and can't relate to because I don't understand it. But folks, just because we don't understand something does not mean it's not a good idea. (laughs) Just because we don't fully understand it doesn't mean we can't still have a revival. We need a revival in this country, and it has to begin with us. And I know there's a verse out there right now that many people like to lift up during these times when there's talk of a revival. And it's 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. And it says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. See, right now, this is a great verse and a great image to lift up for our country. I love this image, healing our land. Wouldn't that be great? It's an image I hope we would all eventually get to. But the challenge in those verses is this. It isn't the praying. It isn't the humbling. It isn't even the turning away from sin. What's the key challenge to that verse? If my people who are called by my name, right? The people who are called by my name. My people, God's people. See, there aren't just there just aren't enough of us these days. This is a country that's slowly been and is continuing to forget to call on God's name. And we hear this a lot. And so what are our choices? Well, we can either sit and lament and wish things were better, or we can get up and do something about it. We can complain that this world is going to heck in a handbasket, or we can begin to reclaim this world for God. Of course, something to remember is these verses are framed within the context of Solomon building the temple, right? God is giving Solomon this command now to build this glorious temple, and he's explaining that if his people want a deeper relationship with God, then they will be humble, and they will pray, and they will turn from their sin, and then God will respond. But they were already God's people. They were already the Israelite people, So today in 2018, we need more people of God. We need a revival, and it begins with us. We have to stop saying, if only there were more of God's people, and begin changing that, one person at a time. See, we're called to keep liberty alive and to change lives. We cannot just sit and wish for things to happen. We have the challenge to go out and make a difference. We get to go out and change the world. Because quite simply, a different world cannot be built by indifferent people. Peter Marshall said that one too. (laughs) We cannot be indifferent and simply accept our comfortability. There's too much at stake. And so I want us to take a look at the word revival, what we're talking about here. Yes, it means a period of renewed religious interest and an often highly emotional evangelical meeting or series of meetings. It does mean that. It's actually the first two definitions. But there's also a couple other definitions, one that I think we can can focus on. It also means a renewed attention to or interest in something or a new presentation or publication of something old. All right? Know what a revival can look like for us? A new presentation of something old. Revival means adapting the old into the new. And this is our call. And we have the best example of revival in Jesus Christ. We have liberty in death, right? He took the old way of death and adapted it for us all. He changed death into life. That's a revival at the highest magnitude. And so, my friends, we need this revival. But this revival does not need a tent or a highly charged emotional evangelical meeting. It really doesn't. It doesn't need thousands of people. It would be nice but it needs individual people who value liberty and who aren't afraid to present something new in a different way to others. It needs the gifts that each and every one of us has been given, and we use them to begin to present the gospel in these new and creative ways so that others will now begin to ask questions and want to experience what we already know. 
what we already have in Jesus Christ. See, it needs us starting to connect to each other. It's kind of running the numbers. We average about 700, 750 folks on a weekend, right? So if we start sharing each one-on-one with each other, that 700 becomes 1,400, right? And then that 1,400 then becomes 2,800. And if we're really good and we keep doing it, it's, it's 2,800 becomes 5,600. And then I had to stop because <laughs> I ran out of toes. But if each of us does our own part, you get the, the sense, right? We can reclaim this country. And so if you've even been invited here today to experience the way our congregation celebrates God and celebrates country, then welcome to our revival. We're glad you're here. See, this service is a great celebration. But please know that we put God first. It's not country and God. It's God and country. And we celebrate not only liberty that our forefathers did win for us, but more importantly, we celebrate the liberty that Jesus Christ has won for us. And so you see, we're, we're a community of faith that is connected to God. And we're connected by the blood of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he freely gave to us. We know he was nailed to the cross for us. We know that he died on that cross, and we know that he overcame that death and was raised again for us to give us that liberty from sin and from death so we can enjoy a life with him forever. That's why we're gathered here this morning, to celebrate the liberty that is available through Jesus Christ. So we do welcome you. We're glad you're here, and we hope you'll continue to come back. But we will not be ashamed to proclaim our liberty through Jesus Christ. Amen? Not done. <laughs> the Apostle Paul helps us understand this liberty through Jesus Christ. It was in our reading that, that uh, we heard. And he talks about the old covenant that God had with the people in the time of Moses. At that time in ancient Israel, God was speaking to Moses primarily. And as you may know, they actually held to the law as their saving grace. They didn't know about Jesus. But once he showed up, once Jesus came and changed things, the Lord, this Jesus, he changed it for all of us. And Paul affirms for us that, that Jesus is the one in whom this liberty lies. And so I want to share again the words of 2 Corinthians with you. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lays over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror for the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. That's exciting. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. That's what we have to offer people. How often do you get that? That's the foundation of our revival. Because without that liberty in Christ, there is only death. We have the liberty because we believe in Jesus Christ. And we have the opportunity to do what is right and to proclaim our risen Lord and his saving grace for all of those who need to know it. So we look at our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honor. We have to take a hard look at what that means to us today. And that's really our stewardship of life as you've heard us talk about in the past. We have to look at these things through the sacrificial lens of Jesus Christ and see what's really important to us and then see how we can use it for the glory of God today. So is our faith important? Absolutely. Is our liberty in Christ important? Absolutely. But is it important enough to catapult us beyond these walls into our community with the word of God and to begin this revival with each other one by one? Well, absolutely it is. This is what God and country together is all about. And so we can and we should celebrate these men and women who have served us. And personally, I deeply love those who have served. I know this isn't about me, but as we're getting to know each other, I just want to share with you. I humbly was able to contribute uh, four pictures of the servicemen for the presentation that you'll see before and after on that slideshow. My uncle, my father, my brother, and my son. Got the whole thing covered. <laughs> two have served this country, and two will, and still are, continuing to serve. And so the importance of servicemen and women is not lost on me. And the sacrifice 
of servicemen and women that their families go through is not lost on me either. At any given time, I could have lost a family member and still potentially could to the country's defense of liberty. And I would have been and would be proud to do so. But Jesus Christ and the revival that his liberty through his death can give us is so much bigger. And my family knows that. And our country's liberty is just temporary, right? But our Lord's liberty is everlasting. And so that's what we base our revival on, folks. It's plain and simple. We have to help others see that there is liberty in death. Liberty came to this country through the defense and the deaths of so many. And it's continued to be upheld through this sacrifice of so many more. But the ultimate liberty, the ultimate freedom of salvation, can only come to us through one death. The death of one man on the cross, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And so we have to have the same resolve that our forefathers had about liberty. It has to be important to us. Important enough to sacrifice our own comfort, our own lives, our own fortunes, and our sacred honor so that others can also experience this freedom in Christ. And so I began this proclamation with a prayer from Peter Marshall, and I'd like to end it with a quote of his as well. May freedom be seen not as the right to do as we please, but as the opportunity to please to do what is right. May it be ever understood that our liberty is under God and can be found nowhere else. May our faith be something that is not merely stamped upon our coins, but expressed in our lives. Let us, as a nation, be not afraid of standing alone for the rights of men since we were born that way, as the only nation on earth that came into being for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. We don't talk like that anymore. <laughs> but our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor live in the glory of God. And they live in the liberty and the death and resurrection that Jesus gives us. So that's what we get to go and proclaim. It's time to get a revival started. One life at a time. Starting with our own. And may God bless America. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching. Trinity Lutheran Church can be found at 1100 Philadelphia Road in Joppa, Maryland. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you like this video, go ahead and click the like button. That's a thumbs up button right here on the YouTube page. And you could also be a big help to us if you go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you very much, and God bless.